Welcome to cardiac function. First, we're gonna look at the anatomy of the heart. The, the heart is a hollow muscular organ that's about the size of your fist. It's located in the middle section of the chest cavity between the lower lobes of each lung and slightly to the left of the sternum. As you can see from the picture above, you've got two upper chambers and two lower chambers. The upper chambers are the atria and the lower chambers are the ventricles. The right and left sides of the heart are separated by a septum and each atrium is attached to a ventricle by an atrial ventricle valve or a mitral valve on the left and a tricuspid valve on the right. The different layers of the heart consist of the epicardium, which is the outermost layer, the myocardium, which is the middle, and the endocardium, which is the inner layer. The pericardium is a double-layered fibrous membrane that encloses the entire heart. Sometimes in the laboratory, we get pericardial fluid down from surgery, per se. And this is a coating of liquid that prevents friction between the two layers of the heart as it beats. It's kind of a lubrication fluid, if you will. Occasionally, when someone's got myocarditis or some type of infection or inflammation of the heart, in the laboratory in the microbiology department, we can test to see if there are any issues with that fluid. We're going to go over a couple pathological conditions of the heart or different types of heart disease. The first one is just generally cardiovascular disease, sometimes called CVD. This is a very debilitating condition affecting 80 million adults in the United States. It's responsible for deaths of approximately 2,400 Americans daily. That's quite a bit. Timely and accurate diagnosis is um, made difficult by lack of testing, but hospitals are getting more and more, um, I shouldn't say more better, they're getting they're improving at um, the timeliness of doing these tests and the amount of time it takes to get the patient from the minute they come in the door to the surgical suite to try and fix any um, blockages or anything that may have occurred. Congestive heart failure is one of them. We use a BNP test for that. I'm going to go over that in more detail at the end of this section. And acute coronary syndromes, also known as acute myocardial infarction or a heart attack. We have seven classic symptoms of somebody with cardiovascular disease. You're going to have to be familiar with these terms. Dyspnea is shortness of breath. Chest pain, also sometimes called angina pectoris, is pain radiating from the heart or chest. Heart palpitations, that's when you can feel your own heartbeat. Like when someone scares the daylights out of you and all of a sudden you're like, oh my gosh, and you just feel your heart pounding. Syncope is the same as fainting. Edema is usually the swelling of tissue due to the retention of water or lymph fluids. Cyanosis is a bluish discoloration of the skin. And having fatigue, which is an overall feeling of weariness or just a lack of energy. We can also have congenital cardiovascular defects that you're born with. These are abnormalities that arise from abnormal formation of the heart or its major blood vessels. Some of the signs and symptoms are that cyanosis, which is the bluish colored skin, pulmonary hypertension, which would be high blood pressure, clubbing of the fingers, embolism, which is a blood clot, having reduced growth in syncope or fading, fainting. Some things that can cause this would be the mom having a rubella infection when she's pregnant with a baby, a mom using alcohol while she's pregnant. Drug treatment and radiation can cause cardiovascular issues and having genetic or chromosomal abnormalities can as well. The next one is heart failure. This results from any structural or functional cardiac disorder that impairs the ability of a ventricle to fill with or eject blood. When the left side of the heart cannot pump, excess fluid fills the lungs. Pulmonary edema and reduced output of blood to systemic circulation occurs. When the right side of the heart cannot pump, Excess fluid ends up in the systemic circulation and we see generalized edema. Some of the common causes would be coronary artery disease, any type of cardiomyopathies, um, inflammatory heart disease, valvular diseases, or any type of arrhythmia. When we see someone with an acute coronary issue, we usually have some type of syndromes that take place. The continuum events includes angina or that chest pain, 
There can be a reversible tissue injury depending on how early it's caught. Unstable angina, which is chest pain that comes and goes. We can have an actual heart attack or a myocardial infarction or we can find extensive tissue necrosis depending on how far along it is or how severe the event could be. The symptoms of the patient when they usually come in the emergency room would be chest pain, um, pain radiating down their arm, usually their left arm, nausea, vomiting, difficulty breathing, diaphoresis, which is when they look pale, um, and lightheadedness. Usually the causes of this are some type of atherosclerosis, which is a thickening and a hardening of the artery walls by plaque deposits over time. And um, we can have narrowing of the arteries from that. Sometimes the plaque becomes disrupted and a clot can form. I had this happen to one of my students in the intro class a couple years ago. Um, she went in because she was gonna have some other surgery done and they found some issues. So they decided to go in and do a, um, go in um, arthroscopically or whatever and look at the her heart and her arteries. When they did that, the probe they were using as they went up through her leg hit a piece of plaque. It broke off and it actually broke a hole in her artery. She had to go in for um, open heart surgery. They had to crack her chest open and everything. Um, but what can happen in some cases is if that plaque becomes disrupted on its own without it being hit with the camera, um, a clot can form and that would cause a clot to plug something up. We can also have predisposing factors that can kind of make these things more apparent, such as your age, your sex, family history, having dyslipidemia, which means your cholesterol, your um, LDL is too high, smoking, having high blood pressure, a sedentary lifestyle, and having diabetes. So what about hypertensive heart disease? This is heart disease caused by direct or indirect effects of elevated blood pressure. My husband, for example, had a blood pressure of 179 over 110. He had no idea. So these are things that if you're made aware of early on, they can kind of treat to avoid any damage to the heart. This can include a left ventricular hypertrophy, a coronary artery disease, cardiac arrhythmias, or congestive heart failure. These can all, a heart having a high blood pressure can cause any of these issues. The higher the blood pressure, the greater the risk of heart attack, stroke, and kidney diseases. We have a couple classes of hypertension. One can be normal. You can have prehypertension where it's just getting a little bit elevated but not severe, and stage one and then stage two. In some cases, people may feel dizzy, have headaches, have those heart palpitations where they can feel their heart, restlessness, nervousness, or tinnitus. Tinnitus is ringing of the ears. Here's those infective heart diseases. Um, this can be caused by infectious agents. Rheumatic heart disease is a complication of rheumatic fever, which can be from a strep infection. It can also be from an autoimmune type of response attacking the heart. Infective endocarditis is when a bacterial or um, fungal infection attacks the endocardial surface and creates an infection there. Obviously, that could be quite an issue. And pericarditis is an inflammation of the pericardium from having an infection or some type of an autoimmune disorder. So us as laboratorians, how do we help these physicians figure out exactly what is wrong with the patient? A big part of what we can help diagnose is if the patient had a myocardial infarction and potentially when, and we can also tell if they might have congestive heart failure. So let's go over some of those tests that we do and um, we can just kind of review those. So first of all, myocardial infarction is myocardial necrosis due to prolonged ischemia. Ischemia means tissue death. So having a myocardial necrosis, or necrosis means tissue death, ischemia is lack of oxygen. So if there's some type of a heart attack, it can be a lack of oxygen causing tissue death. We can have a couple different types of myocardial infarct. A microscopic one, which is very small, very, very small. Small, which is less than 10% of the left ventricular myocardium, moderate is 10 to 30, and large is greater than 30%. The diagnosis is based on the symptoms a patient is having, doing EKGs, and a rise or fall of sensitive biochemical markers, which we're going to talk about. 
Here are some of the myocardial infarction cardiac markers that we do on a very common basis in the medical laboratory. First one, troponin. This is a preferred marker and we'll go over why in a little bit. But we also recommend a combination of markers. Troponin is a protein that becomes elevated, but the enzyme that becomes elevated of main importance is creatine kinase. Okay. So we also do the isoenzyme of creatinine kinase called CKMB. CKMB would be elevated in a heart attack. Another one that we don't do very often is a myoglobin. This is a cardiac protein which binds oxygen in the cardiac and skeletal muscle. It's clinically useful for its early release from damaged muscle cells or skeletal skeletal trauma, they rise very early and they fall very fast. It's not routinely used. Let me explain why. Somebody's in a car accident, okay, they hit a tree. Did the patient have a heart attack or do they have elevated myoglobin from hitting the tree? It would be elevated in either situation, either from having generalized muscle trauma or from having a heart attack. So you don't know if the person had a heart attack before they hit the tree, or if they hit the tree and the mass trauma caused the myoglobin to be elevated. So this is something that we call not specific, but it's quite sensitive in the fact that it rises very early. So it increases shortly after having a heart attack. But again, it's not very specific to a heart attack, so it's not something that we routinely use anymore. It's an older test. Here's the guy that we really want to talk about, the cardiac troponins. This is a complex of three proteins bound to a thin filament of muscle, troponin T, troponin C, and troponin I. Very sensitive and very specific for myocardial damage. Troponin C is a calcium binding subunit, playing the main role in calcium dependent regulation of muscle contraction. Troponin T and troponin I are um, forms that are different than in skeletal muscle. Usually, um, when I worked in a laboratory, troponin I was the most commonly used for a cardiac infarct, but I'm seeing some labs using a troponin T as well. But in all, troponin, in general, is the best protein to detect heart disease. It increases within about four hours of having a heart attack, and it stays elevated for seven to 10 days. So even if someone had chest pain over the weekend and they went to the doctor on Monday or Tuesday, the doctor would be able to run this test and see that sure enough, he may have had a heart attack in the last week. Here's another one of those cards. I brought up a few of these in the past. This is by Valerie Polanski out of, uh, gosh, Pensacola, Florida, or uh, I believe. And she made these cards, these review cards, and they're fabulous. I highly recommend that you buy them. This one goes over some of the cardiac markers of importance and when they become elevated and for how long. So CKMB becomes elevated four to eight hours after having chest pain and it stays elevated for two to three days. That one's quite specific, um, or it's more sensitive, comes up right away. Not entirely specific for an MI, but pretty good. LD1 and LD2, which are um, lactate dehydrogenase, that one elevates after 12 to 24 hours and stays elevated for five days, but it's not specific and not sensitive. Something like this could be elevated in liver disease as well. Myoglobin, he elevates very quickly, three to four hours, but he only stays elevated for 24 hours. Remember, he's not very specific. He can be elevated in other circumstances as well. Here's my cardiac troponins, elevated within four hours and stay elevated for seven to 10 days. Very sensitive, very specific. Here's a pictorial of what those look like for those of you that like pictures. Down in the bottom, we have myoglobin, and he's the one with the open um, circles here. He rises very quite quickly. He's the first one out the gates, but he doesn't get up as high, and he drops very quickly. Within 24 hours, he's gone. Now look at your opponent. After about three to four hours, he goes up so fast, extremely high, and stays elevated for seven to 10 days. The other one here we have within 12 hours, CKMB starts to rise, comes down, stays elevated for a couple days here. 
Probably not as good as troponin, but in most cases we do CKMB and troponin together in the laboratory. That's the most, those are the two most common tests for heart attack. A couple other things that we can do to look for inflammation and other types of problems. First one is a high sensitive CRP, sometimes called an HSCRP. People that have a very high dyslipidemias, um, a poor diet, things like that can have what's called systemic inflammation going on within the body. They can have inflammation in the heart, in the arteries, they can have inflammation with the um, various areas. And by doing a low level of CRP, if we can pick up a low level of CRP, it could mean that that person has systemic inflammation going on within their body. And it's a high predictive value for someone. If they don't seem to have coronary artery disease now, they will develop it very soon. Homocysteine um, assesses for an increased risk of cardiovascular disease and is a marker for inflammation as well. Um, atherosclerosis, sensitivity for blood clots, people that have high homocysteine levels seem to get more blood clots than others. This one I mentioned earlier, congestive heart failure. A B-type natriuretic peptide is released on ventric ventricular stretch or stress on myocytes in the absence of necrosis. Here's what happens. For example, if you have high blood pressure over time or some other issues going on in your cardiovascular system, that heart starts to get larger. And as it gets larger, those um, myocytes start to stretch. When they stretch, they release that BNP. So if somebody has a lot of BNP floating in their bloodstream, it could mean that they have congestive heart failure, especially the levels above um, 20 picomoles per liter. That concludes our section on the cardiac function.